Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Aaron Sheldrick, and I work for Reuters. Four years after the Fukushima nuclear disaster, Tokyo Electric Power Co. continues to struggle with uh, piling up water, contaminated water at the site, and only yesterday received a rap over the knuckles for failing to adequately and timely disclose information on the latest leaks. Um, well, today we have the person that delivered that rap, Dale Klein, a former NRC uh, commissioner and the, the chairman of TEPCO's Nuclear Reform Monitoring Committee. I don't really think I need to introduce Dale anymore. He's well known now in, in Tokyo and Japan. So we'll have a few brief remarks from, from Dale uh, and then we'll open the floor to questions. Before I hand over, please turn off or mute your mobile devices. Thank you very much. Please give your appreciation to Dr. Dale Klein. Well, thank you. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, as uh, you probably know, in my real life, I'm in higher education. So I view uh, my role here today and hopefully with the Q&A as helping with that educational uh, aspect. As you know, uh, and as was just stated, um, we just spent the fourth anniversary of uh, 311. Uh, this was obviously a time for the people of Japan to reflect back on the trauma that they experienced, both with the earthquake and with the tsunami that followed. This was very profound indeed for the people of Japan. Japan's uh, good friends in the United States stood by them in 311, and we continue to stand by them today. The resilience that the Japanese people have shown in recovering from the 311 disaster has been quite remarkable. I've been honored to play a small role in uh, this activity, and as was just indicated, I chair the Nuclear Reform Committee for TEPCO. Our job is to provide them with praise when they earn it and provide them with prodding when they need some additional activities. Oftentimes, as we find out from these Nuclear Reform Committee meetings, there's a little bit of both. And that's really to be expected from a complicated task that is involved in the cleanup of Fukushima Daiichi. Today, I'd like to share with you my own views of where TEPCO was standing with regard to the cleanup activities, what it needs to accomplish more, and then also to talk a little bit about KK. But I'd briefly like to explain the additional role our reform committee is considering in light of our recent meeting. As was just explained, TEPCO announced a few weeks ago that it had found some contamination. And what was interesting from this activity was the fact that they had not disclosed it publicly. TEPCO had worked both with NRA and with METI in terms of discussing this information, but they had not talked to the public in terms of releasing that information. While this water release did, did not create a safety or environmental issue, it did raise the question about openness and transparency, and it did create anxiety to the public. Understandably, this led to accusations that TEPCO had withheld information from the public, and it threatened to undo several years of hard work for TEPCO to reestablish their credibility of being open and transparent. Indeed, this experience was frustrating for me personally because we had been encouraging TEPCO to become more transparent in communicating more effectively with the public, and they had specifically formed a social communications office to enhance the flow of information to the public. Clearly, this was a failure in the social communications office. I shared this disappointment with TEPCO's chairman, Sudo, Subsequently, Chairman Sudo asked the three non-TEPCO members of our committee, myself, Deputy Chairman Lady Barbara Judge, and Mr. Sakaraya, to oversee an independent audit with Mr. Sakaraya in the lead. Mr. Sakaraya, as you know, was a former prosecutor 
and he was involved in the Fukushima accident for Japan's diet. The audit is examining the non-disclosure of the drainage information and will issue its report, along with recommendations to ensure that all information is communicated to the public promptly, accurately, and thoroughly. The company has pledged to make this report public. A slightly longer inquiry will look more deeply into whether structural changes are needed to be enhanced within TEPCO. The company has promised to make this report public. And I want you to know, and surely anyone who knows Mr. Sakuraya, knows that the inquiries will follow the facts wherever they may lead. They will report the facts accurately, and they will make whatever recommendations are warranted. Without in any way prejudicing the results of the inquiry, I can tell you that as a nuclear engineer, that engineers have a difficulty in communicating. For all the best reasons, engineers often want to know everything about a situation before they say anything. After all, lives can oftentimes depend on getting it right. But sometimes what is diligence to an engineer will appear as concealment to the public. And the technical people at TEPCO need to understand that they need to react in a different way so they can respond more quickly and they have an obligation to share information before they know all the facts so they can reduce unnecessary anxieties. I think President Hirose got it right when speaking to employees at Fukushima Daiichi on the fourth anniversary when he said, TEPCO's workers must approach these issues by empathizing with the people of Fukushima, including the fishermen who want so badly to move forward with their lives. Failures in transparency, even where no one was exposed to radiation and where no environmental harm is done, still creates an anxiety to the population that instead needs to have confidence and trust in terms of TEPCO. TEPCO needs to work hard to restore this trust, and if they follow President Hirose's admonition, I believe they will get things right in the future. It's very important that ineffectual communication does not obscure the genuine progress that TEPCO is making at Fukushima, at KK, and in its overall development of a safety culture. It's important because critical decisions are being made about the future of TEPCO, the future of its facilities, and about the future of nuclear energy, both in Japan and around the world. It's essential that these decisions be made with a clear understanding of what has been done in what remains to be accomplished, both in the cleanup and in the restart activities. Anyone who has been at the site shortly after 311, who has been there recently, as your fearless leader here, can see that progress is occurring. What is abundantly clear is that work has been transitioned from an initial phase of cleanup and stabilization, where the main goals were to get the reactor under control to now the beginnings of a genuinely decontamination. Most impressively, TEPCO designed and erected a massive, technically remarkable cantilevered structure over reactor unit four to help remove the spent fuel assemblies. Nearly 2,000 spent fuel assemblies were removed from spent fuel number four, a building that had been heavily damaged but was not operating at the time of the accident. If you recall, there were probably a lot of prophets of doom that said TEPCO could not do it and they could not do it safely. But one of the aspects that I was impressed with during this movement was a, a glimmer of a safety culture coming in within TEPCO where they actually stopped the process, talked to the people involved to see if there could be ways it could be done better and safer. Units one, two, and three pose their own challenge each of them, unlike Unit 4, which was not operating at the time, suffered a partial meltdown of the nuclear fuel. As a result, the radiation levels inside these structures are higher, working in them is more problematic, and the challenge of extracting the partially melted cores will be difficult. This is a challenge that has never been faced before in the world, and there will have to be new equipment developed to make that happen but I'm confident that it can be done safely and will be done safely. I'm often asked how long I think it will take to remove the fuel or a particular task. And certainly it's important that the task is undertaken with urgency, but
But our committee has always enforced and emphasized that confronted with a situation as complex as unprecedented as the TEPCO faces at Fukushima Daiichi, schedules must always yield to safety. Workers must not feel pressured to meet schedules, they must not compromise safety, and they should not feel that they cannot speak up or hit the pause button if they believe there's a better way to perform a task. In the long run, safety and scheduling go hand in hand. President Hirose made this point well when he was talking to the workers at Fukushima earlier this month, and he noted that safety failures lead to delays and other problems to say nothing about the potential for injury or loss of life. So staying safe helps stay on schedule. The full commitment to the culture that TEPCO has started has not yet complete, but recent months our committee has urged TEPCO to ensure that the safety first attitude that President Hirose articulated extends all the way down to the working levels. It has to go to the frontline supervisors, it has to also go to the partners and contractors and to their frontline workers. This is something we will continue to monitor in the coming months. As all of, all of you know, Fukushima Daiichi sits on the mountain between the mountains and the sea. As I oftentimes say, even in Japan, water flows downhill. Water is going to be a continuing challenge for this site. Any of you who have dealt with a water leak in your own home knows how challenging water can be. At Fukushima, Daiami, at Fukushima Daiichi, it dwarfs about anything that I've seen in terms of a complex water management system. The Nuclear Reform Monitoring Committee has on a number of occasions pressed TEPCO to address water issues with more urgency and to a greater degree than they have responded to. Significant progress in keeping water out of the contaminated site, in treating water that enters the site and becomes contaminated, and in safely storing the water is an issue that will have to be considered. The amount of water that becomes contaminated on a daily basis has been reduced by about 100 tons per day. With the cooperation of the Fukushima fishermen, a system is now in place that enables water to be bypassed that is not contaminated through that site. Additional steps are being taken to further reduce the quantity of water that flows into the reactor buildings and becomes contaminated. Perhaps the most well-known of these is a frozen soil or the ice wall that is being built around the site at Fukushima Daiichi. We're dealing with a technology that is well known but has never been tried on this length of scale for this long. Reducing the amount of water flowing into the reactor buildings is an important goal for TEPCO. And NRA's decision last week to allow TEPCO to go ahead and freeze the land side portion is a reasonable start. But we need to stop thinking about one single technology solving all the problems. This is a complex campaign, and I believe many technologies, engineering approaches are going to be needed before they are fully successful. This is one of the more important reasons to focus on the progress that is made in water treatment. TEPCO now has a series of systems that are commonly referred to as the seven samurai, which are to remove the radioactive elements from the water. All the elements can be removed except tritium. Tritium is an element of hydrogen, so it's very difficult to separate hydrogen from water because that's an integral part. There's a lot of tritium in the world. In fact, if you look at any moment, there are about 2.6 million terabecals of tritium on Earth. Most of this is in the ocean. That's many times the amount of tritiated water at Fukushima. So there's no question that properly diluted, this water can be safely discharged. At Three Mile Island, the tritiated water was evaporated, but it was a much smaller quantity. That's not a, a really option at Fukushima because if the tritiated water were evaporated, it would likely flow out over the ocean, condensed and fall back into the water. So it, it really does not work in this situation. The decision to return the water to the ocean is an intensely emotional one. It will involve the Japanese people. It will certainly involve the fishermen, 
but I hope at the end that science will rule the decision. Most people don't know what tritium is, so what they will think about is that it's bad, it's something that's really dangerous, but tritium is an element that we know a lot about, and there are world standards for its proper discharge. The Japanese people, particularly the fishermen, through their agreement with the groundwater bypass system, demonstrated a willingness to negotiate and understand what needs to happen for the site to be cleaned. And I'm confident that they will do the same for the, for the tritium. We have this slight problem of my notebook is larger than the podium, so we... <laughs> we apologize for this. <laughs> I, I'm used to things in Texas being bigger. <laughs> Sometimes we get so focused on Fukushima Daiichi that we forget that TEPCO has to keep the lights on. They have to supply electricity for tens of millions of people in Tokyo area and Yokohama. This energy is needed for homes, for people's schools, for workplaces, for things like this club. Since Japan has shut down all of its nuclear power plant, too much of its electricity now is being produced with expensive carbon emitting fossil fuels, and much of this is being obtained, obtained from some of the world's most unstable places. So restarting Japan's nuclear plants, including Kashiwazaka Kariwa, isn't just a priority for TEPCO, it's also important for the country of Japan, and for reasons I'll explain in a moment, it's also important to the rest of the world. I've been to KK several times and I've seen the physical changes that have been made to strengthen the facility. And it's also important to make changes to the operator training and to their procedures as well. In addition to the physical improvements, TEPCO has undertaken a variety of management and personnel improvements. This is more training, repeated safety drills, the inclusion of the Nagita Prefector in terms of the local community communities being involved in emergency planning. TEPCO has stated its goal to make KK not only the largest plant of which it is, but also the safest plant. I believe they're moving in that direction and it is essential that they continue embracing the safety culture that will enable this to happen. TEPCO's application to restart KK is now before the regulatory authorities and it's not for me to say whether that should start or not start. Certainly TEPCO must continue to work hard to earn the trust and confidence of both the regulators and the Japanese for the restart of the KK plant. Whether Japan authorizes the restart of KK or any other nuclear plants that were shut down after 311 is a policy decision for Japan to make. But I will say that there are significant economic, environmental, and security implications of that decision. And they are not just limited to Japan. Continued reliance on imported fossil fuels from other countries that have negative implications for Japan will contribute to carbon emissions. In 2013, Japan significantly scaled back its emissions targets to a 3.8% cut by 2020 versus a 25% reduction that they originally had. At the time they made this announcement, the shuttering of Japan's nuclear power plants was cited as a major reason for this new target. Without nuclear plants, Japan will continue to be dependent on fluctuating prices for fossil fuels, and they will be dependent upon importing them from some very unstable places. That res represents a security risk for Japan and for its friends in the US and elsewhere that rely on Japan as a standard of stability and democracy for this part of the world. A decline or abundant or abandonment of nuclear power in Japan would also send an unfortunate signal to the rest of the world, which would make fighting climate change more difficult. It would have a major impact on the world's nuclear infrastructure. Many nuclear components worldwide are made here in Japan by companies like Mitsubishi, Hitachi, Toshiba, and Japan Steelworks. But I remain an optimist. I'm deeply impressed by the resilience and determination of the Japanese people, and I also have been impressed by the willingness of TEPCO to embrace change. This is difficult for a proud company with rich traditions and a long history. I know that you and the media will keep the pressure on TEPCO and the government, as you should, 
while at the same time fulfilling your role in educating the public on nuclear issues. Public trust and confidence depends on a free, diligent press, and while as a former government official, I can tell you it's not only fun being on the receiving side of that diligence, but I understand how indispensable you are in communicating with the public and keeping them informed. Equally indispensable has been the assistance provided by organizations, companies, and governments around the world, including my country of the United States. Their provision of technical and other assistance, along with moral support and encouragement, has meant a great deal to the people working hard at Fukushima. One of our most famous presidents, Thomas Jefferson, said, whenever the public are well informed, they can be treated and trusted with their own government. What that really means is the public understands the facts, both good and bad, they will make the right decisions. The Reform Committee and TEPCO management understands that we have a responsibility to ensure that all of our employees understand that communicating the facts, both good and bad, are the foundation for building public trust and good government policy. It has been an honor and privilege to play a small part in helping TEPCO and Japan recover from 311. Whenever I'm here, and especially when I travel to the Tohoku region, I remember the terrible damage and suffering caused by the earthquake and the tsunami. If I can play a small role in moving forward from the effects of that day, it will be extremely gratifying. But whatever role I play in the long run, TEPCO, Japan, and its people will meet these challenges, and they will prevail. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll open up the floor to questions to the working press first. And I can see a hand up already. Uh, first of all, no, only one question per uh, person and no speeches. I, I noticed that uh, you have working press. So does that mean you have non-working press? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Richard Lloyd Parry from The Times. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the, the technical challenge of dealing with units one, two, and three. I was uh, at the plant last week on, on a tour, and we talked to Mr. Ono, the, the boss. And he made no bones about the fact that um, the, the technology that would be needed to deal with this task, to remove the, the molten or semi-molten fuel doesn't exist yet. It's going to have to be invented. And, and I asked him, well, uh, how can you be sure that it will be? And he said, well, 200 years ago, people would never have dreamt of bullet trains or mobile phones, but they exist. Um, that seems to be the, the scale of the leap, in his mind at least, which is going to be required. So there must be immense uncertainties around that. And I wondered how you saw that. And also, that there must surely be a chance uh, that it won't work out and that the eventual solution will be something like the Chernobyl solution, undesirable as that seems, a sarcophagus of some kind just sealing in the three plants. Um, and then secondly, this is only half a question, not a second question. Um, Forgive my, my ignorance on this, but could you tell us a bit about the Reform Committee and its nature as an organisation? I mean, to put it bluntly, um, who appoints you and who pays you and your expenses? Thanks. Sure. I'll uh, answer the uh, last question first because that's the one with the shortest answer. Uh, I was asked uh, by uh, TEPCO to chair the Reform Committee. The Reform Committee consists of two non-Japanese and three Japanese members. The chairman of TEPCO is uh, an automatic member, so when the, the chairmanship changed from Chairman Shimakobe to Chairman Sudo, then they made that transition. Uh, like most consulting that I do, I do receive an honorarium, and I also receive travel expenses. Uh, most faculty members are not independently wealthy, so the kind of consulting that I do is uh, it's a standard process, so there's no difference in my role here. Uh, I don't believe the Japanese uh, members get compensated, but I, I don't know that for sure. 
So that's the structure. So I was asked by TEPCO, and I think one of the reasons I was probably asked is, as a former chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and as an academic, uh, I, uh, I had a background that could advise them. And also having tenure means that I can be irreverent and tell TEPCO what I think they should hear rather than what they would like to hear. So I think that's an advantage. I also had co-chaired an analysis of the Fukushima Daiichi accident for the American Nuclear Society, along with Dr. Mike Cordini, uh, after the accident. So I had some background in, in that area. So that's the Reform Committee. Uh, we basically will exist as long as we feel that we're adding value. If I feel I'm not making progress or added value, I have uh, plenty to do uh, in my day job at the University of Texas. In terms of uh, new skills that are needed uh, for the cleanup of the molten fuel, this is something that has never uh, been done at this scale before. The accident at Three Mile Island is probably the closest. Uh, in that regard, there was also molten fuel, but it stayed within the reactor vessel. What is, uh, has occurred here with units one, two, and three is that the molten fuel penetrated the bottom of the vessel, and we don't know yet whether it went through the normal penetrations or if it actually melted part of that vessel. They, they will not know until they can get in there with either robotics or other sensors to tell exactly how much and where it moved. But I think one of the advantages that we have um, in the world is that TEPCO and Japan are known for use of robotics. So I think there's an inherent advantage to the technology that exists here in Japan to develop those new skills and those techniques. In the case of Three Mile Island, they initially thought about using robots and doing it all remotely. But the fact that they could flood the vessel and then retrieve it in the, with mechanical manipulators with people watching it was the preferred alternative. At units one, two, and three, the radiation levels are too high to do that, and so they will have to be done with robotics, and they will have to develop new tools and new techniques. But I don't believe that it is anything that is insurmountable. Uh, th those tools and equipments do not exist today, but the fundamental knowledge of remote, robotically controlled uh, devices, I think, will be uh, sufficient. And whoever develops those will probably be compensated quite adequately for that technology. So a, a Chernobyl solution is out of the question? I think it is. I, there's, uh, at this point, I don't believe there's any reason to do it. And I think the attitude of Japan would not to be built a mausoleum over it. I, I believe that Japan would like to return that to as much of a greenfield site as possible. And on the technology front, the early use of the muon um, uh, particle generator or whatever it's really called it doesn't seem to be showing up much is that a failure of the equipment or just something else this is the muon technology is unique um, when i went through my physics classes as an undergraduate we only looked at protons neutrons and electrons now there we found there's a lot of other elements in there so this is a new technology and it will probably need to be refined a little bit before it gives re really precise information. But I believe what will happen is that eventually they will send in robotics with very good cameras to find out what the conditions are. And, and that will be likely the technology. Right now, I think TEPCO and uh, the country of Japan is wanting to try any techniques that might provide additional insight and information. And this uh, Muon technology will probably get uh, more improvement as time goes on. My name is Crowell with Nuclear Intelligence Weekly in New York. Uh, as you know, the restart process is moving very slowly. It, if uh, the Sendai plan goes on uh, in July, as it hopes, it'll have been two years after they file for conformance review. That means that many of the reactors are going to be offline for five years, six years, seven years. The Kachiwazaki plants, were, some of them weren't even online before the accident, and so they'll be offline for eight, nine, 10, 12 years. Is this a problem? 